Hello and welcome to tonight's program, which is brought to you by Kensington and Chelsea Libraries. Um, tonight we have a special treat for you, a session about Gallery Borghese uh, with uh, the fabulous Olga Tuchkovic. Uh, uh, this is um, a session about one of the most um, beautiful museums in the whole of Rome um, and it's being presented uh, by Olga who some of you uh, will remember from a recent session on Dubrovnik and on, on Rome in general that she did for the libraries in the last few months. Um, in this talk, which is beautifully illustrated by her own photographs, um, she will guide us through the history of the collection that's kept, uh, kept in the mu museums or galleries Borghese. Um, and being a lover of art herself, um, um, she is, um, I'm sure, going to do it justice. Um, Olga has started working as a tour guide in her hometown of Dubrovnik, but has lived and worked um, in Rome for the past 30 years. Um, she obtained a master's degree in arts management in the American University of Rome last year um, and is a perfectly place to show us this beautiful gallery. So you'll be able to ask Olga questions through the chat at the end of her presentation. We will try to accommodate as many as we can. Uh, but now, without further ado, it's a great, great pleasure to introduce to you Olga Trutskovic. Welcome, Olga. Buonasera. Buonasera, everyone. Good evening. And uh, uh, yes, as Nina, uh, already explained. I'm going to talk about the Gallery Borghese, one of the most beautiful museums in the world and uh, in Rome. Definitely it has an amazing reputation, so I hope I'll be able to transmit the reasons why. So uh, let's start from, from somewhere from the actual uh, entrance to the Villa Borghese. Villa Borghese is the name of the gardens that are it, amazing uh, pedestrian area of about uh, 80 hectares or about 200 acres and they're right outside of this serious looking wall. Those are the Aurelian walls that were built in the third century to prevent the barbarians from entering ancient Rome. Well, who are the barbarians? That's another another story, future Europeans and Americans and uh, so many people. But in the third century, there was need to defend Rome uh, from the invading tribes. And uh, uh, the gardens start there and they're full of uh, fountains and museums. Uh, uh, there's also uh, uh, a cinema, there's a theater, there's a zoo, a uh, favorite place of the Romans to go for a picnic. But uh, Gallery Borghese is the most famous part of it, right outside of the, uh, the gardens. There is the fanciest uh, uh, neighborhood of Rome outside of the historical center of Rome. There is Parioli, so much that fancy Romans uh, like to address themselves as Pariolini. And uh, uh, Gallery Borghese is a story in itself very specific because it was the purpose built uh, uh, palazzo of a cardinal. This is the gate through which uh, you enter and let me just explain where it is with uh, respect to the rest of the gardens. Well, um, I'll be using my zoom here. Uh, we are here uh, on the eastern part, in the eastern part of the Villa Borghese Park. It says Piazzale del Museo Borghese and then you may wish to walk towards the zoo or in the very center you see this round Colosseum like building that is a theater that was built as a replica of the Globe Theater. There are even the lakes and there's a, a riding um, track and uh, people rent bikes uh, uh, here all the way to the west. There is uh, a Piazzale Flaminio, like a big square, but that is actually the northern entrance, northern gate to Rome, uh, Piazza del Popolo, People's uh, uh, Square. And going forward south, you see here it says uh, Spagna. And uh, that was the neighborhood right outside of the Spanish steps. Now, this is the entrance to the Gallery Borghese. The gardens uh, uh, stretch also behind uh, the palazzo. And uh, uh, here this video will end uh, with uh, the image of a dragon 
and an eagle, that is the coat of arms uh, of the Borghese family, um, symbolizing always uh, strength and, and purity, and uh, eagle uh, was also the symbol of ancient Rome, of Zeus, and, uh, and so many important uh, symbols were connected with eagles and uh, and dragons. He's the only animal that can, that can look into the sun with his open eyes. Our family Borghese uh, came in power with the Pope. Paul V they came from Siena originally, and uh, Marcantonio uh, Borghese comes to Rome uh, in the 1500s. Within 50, 60 years, they managed to reach uh, the papacy, which is the highest uh, step in the family uh, history. Um, I always say once you have a pope in the family, you're taken care of for generations. And uh, uh, the papal families were sort of royalty during the papacy and uh, uh, the nephews uh, could become very, very powerful, especially the favorite nephew who was known as uh, uh, Cardinal Nipote, the nephew. Uh, Nipote also means a grandchild, so there was sometimes a bit of a confusion about that, but uh, mainly they, they were actually the nephews and they would become like prime ministers. And of course, the offices, the land, uh, the dispensing of the noble titles uh, made these families very, very powerful. And uh, uh, the Pope Paul V had this uh, favorite nephew who studied law in uh, Perugia and he made him a cardinal at the age of 26. Uh, Scipione Borghese, had a penchant for art and uh, he had quite unorthodox methods in acquiring his art and that's what we're going to uh, learn about but uh, uh, the collection was uh, uh, typically it was uh, customary for the noble families to start uh, collecting art as uh, a way as means of ennobling the the family especially if they did not really have noble roots uh, eventually they would reach nobility but having an um, art collection uh, meant that they were learned and uh, uh, that they had the knowledge because uh, art is knowledge and knowledge is power. Now, uh, to, uh, before we enter the, the Gallery Borghese, I also wanted to show you right to the left, very, very close. Uh, there is this amazing building, one of the many buildings that the Cardinal built in his m former vineyards uh, uh, that became like the country, country villa. This is an aviary from 1617, and it's uh, uh, probably the only one from that time that still retains its original cage where the exotic birds were once kept for the cardinal and his guests' amusement. Now, this is the, uh, the portico, the entrance to the Gallery Borghese, uh, where you can see some, well, broken statues. Uh, they have not been uh, restored. Uh, uh, it was a custom at that time, until very modern times, until a few decades ago, uh, to graft different heads uh, that just fitted the statues because the the taste of the period at that time uh, was uh, uh, they loved things to be beautiful more so than authentic. And uh, uh, today it's a completely different approach, but uh, they kept them uh, broken and uh, we see this lovely Venus in the corner to create the feeling of, you know, you're entering through the garden and you are discovering these ruins and that's the way these uh, statues, most of them were discovered through the excavations in the, in the private properties. This lovely sarcophagus comes from the St. Peter's Basilica. It was once uh, in the, uh, the Vatican Cemetery and then it actually uh, reached the collection quite late in the 1800s. And uh, the Villa Borghese, the Gallery Borghese, is also sometimes used for the exhibitions. So this was one of the contemporary art exhibitions and there are usually really interesting juxtapositions. Uh, remember the amazing uh, exhibition Francis Bacon versus Caravaggio. We're going to talk a lot about Caravaggio because Caravaggio and Bernini are the most important artists of this gallery. And now we have entered the, the central hall, the reception hall or salone, and uh, uh, we were meant to be impressed. But uh, uh, what you see is not entirely from the times of the Cardinal, which was uh, early uh, 1600s. His uncle was a Pope between 1605 and 1621 to give you the time frame. And uh, uh, later on, the family is, is still around. They still have beautiful properties uh, and uh, they no longer own uh, this gallery. They had financial problems. And in 1902, they sold it to the Italian state together with the gardens. But 
uh, before that, before that, in the late 1700s, Marcantonio IV, uh, Borghese, uh, refurbished the villa. So the decorations you see on the walls and the ceiling, they, they go back to, to that period. Uh, collecting monumental statues goes back to the times of the Cardinal Borghese and uh, uh, you will see here lovely examples uh, of uh, uh, mainly first, second century statues because that was the time when ancient Romans were the most powerful and then they uh, were inspired by Greek art. Uh, mainly I'll show you more details. For example, the ceiling it may look just like a fancy whirlwind, but uh, not really. There's a lot of politics here. Uh, this is the glorification of the family. It's all presided by uh, Zeus, and there he is, or Jupiter, for the Romans. Uh, and right next to him, to his left and right, there's an eagle, symbol of Zeus, but also the symbol of the family. Let's not forget that. And to the right, the winged figure is the, the victory. Below uh, Jupiter, there is uh, uh, Furio Camillo or Marcus uh, Furius Camillus. Uh, he was uh, a soldier and the patrician of ancient Rome, 4th century BC, and he defeated the Gauls, but he had uh, a triumphal victory four times and he was nicknamed the second Romulus, the second founder of, of Rome. And why is that so important? Because, well, his name, Camillo, uh, Marcantonio, Marcantonio IV uh, had just had a little son, his firstborn, whose name was Camillo. So these are educational, princely examples of the virtues that these young noble boys uh, uh, were supposed to follow. Little did um, he know that his son will uh, sell more than 400 pieces of art to Napoleon, but we'll, we'll get to to that and uh, uh, the ceiling has a lot to, to show. You see here in the in the center you see an elderly uh, figure that is the uh, the time. The time uh, will reveal the truth. Uh, there are lots of virtues and allegories on these ceilings. The truth is naked because she has nothing to to hide and uh, in front of the truth uh, there were some ugly creatures. Sorry did that I think a little wrong but we'll get back to that I'd like to show them to you uh, these ladies uh, are the uh, calumny or the defamation uh, guile uh, deceit and they are running away defeated by the truth revealed by time so if we have any intentions of saying any gossip about the family well the truth will be revealed sooner or later on the other side of the ceiling, uh, we have the triumphant Rome, triumphal Rome, and then she's right above Romulus and Remus, and um, the she wolf. She is the symbol of Rome. There she is, the she wolf and Romulus and Remus in triumphant Rome. So it's all about the propaganda. It's all uh, allegorically uh, glorifying the, the family. Now, in the middle of the wall, there is a figure uh, that is an amazing example, spectacular example of the restoration and modification of these statues. Uh, the horse is ancient Roman, uh, second century AD, but the rider uh, is uh, modern or contemporary uh, to the Cardinal, 1600s. Pietro Bernini, the father of one and only Gian Lorenzo Bernini, uh, worked already for the, for the Cardinal. And um, this is a recreation of a scene Marcus Curtius, another hero from the 4th century BC, who uh, sacrificed his life for Rome. And he was compared here to the Cardinal, who also helped people affected by a flood of Tiber riding on horseback. So Marcus and then Marcantonio, again, there's plenty to, uh, to talk about. And this statue uh, was uh, initially originally on the facade. Of the, of the building. And uh, um, here, just wanted to show you a little closer this lovely, lovely hat. This is uh, uh, the head of Isis uh, from the second century. It's not all original. You see, these old statues are never entirely original, so difficult to survive the wear and tear. And uh, uh, the lotus is modern. It was maybe meant for the crown. 
but uh, it imitates the, the Greek art of the Greek models of the 5th century uh, BC. Right next to her is a setter. Uh, he derives from the bronze model uh, of Lysippus, but it's probably a copy of one of the colossal um, figures fighting the enemies or fight the fighting guards, protecting uh, Tarentum, uh, nowadays uh, Taranto in the, in the south. And uh, the head uh, was restored and the hands as well, but it's uh, uh, faithful to the prototype because uh, they knew about the prototypes of certain statues in certain situations and uh, their symbols. Then we have a couple of emperors for the good measure. There's Hadrian on the left and there's Antoninus Pius uh, uh, to the right, his successor, flanking Dionysus of, uh, with the god of uh, not just wine and mysteries as well. And uh, uh, his, only his torso is antique, just again to, to give you the uh, the idea of how much is actually antique or not. It didn't even feel need to say it was reintegrated or grafted because the times were like that. The taste was like that. And uh, um, here, let me see. I wanted to show you. Uh, this looks like like Wedgwood uh, because that's again the taste of the 1700s. So if you look at the decorations uh, and you see the way they're made, you can sort of uh, place them in uh, in time. And uh, um, the floors as well. Uh, although Camillo Borghese, after he married Paulina, Napoleon's uh, little sister, uh, he sold off more than 400 pieces between the statues and busts and base reliefs. Uh, the family acquired a lot of art afterwards as well. And also uh, they were lucky and they had many uh, possessions. They were landowners. And in um, 1830s, uh, uh, these mosaics were found and they depict uh, um, different kinds of gladiators and that's how we learn about what was happening in the arenas uh, of the amphitheaters, um, types of gladiators uh, and also about the poor animals, there were these hunting uh, Venatio games uh, uh, that would take place usually in the morning prior to the afternoon uh, uh, gladiator duels. And now we're upstairs. Uh, we jumped upstairs uh, where most of the, the paintings are kept. We'll be going back downstairs uh, to see the most important uh, statues. This uh, marvelous loggia retains still the original ceiling painted by Lanfranco uh, in the 1600s, early 1600s. And uh, it was an open loggia, now it's a hall, and uh, there were a lot of uh, paintings of the landscapes to connect the, uh, the ambience with the, with the gardens. But uh, things have changed now, and uh, uh, the gardens are still there though. Uh, why so many ancient uh, Greek and Roman gods? Because the learned people uh, studied classical uh, mythology, Latin, philosophy, uh, theater, math, geometry, and uh, uh, the representing of ancient gods, the gods of Olympus, uh, was sort of invoking the return of the Golden Age, of course, connected with uh, the current pope. And uh, um, with the illusionist, uh, uh, illusionistic ceiling architecture, um, it kind of creates the illusion that these gods are mixing up with the invitees of the of the cardinal. We have them all there. Uh, here is um, Zeus and Hera in the center at the top, and Zeus is being crowned uh, uh, by justice. And in the middle, the lovely naked lady. Uh, is uh, Venus uh, with Mars, uh, uh, then all the way to the right, handsome Apollo. And uh, um, here at the bottom, you have uh, Hades and Proserpine. So she's uh, petting Cerberus. Uh, she wasn't very happy at the beginning of their story, but we'll, we'll get there a bit, uh, a bit later. So more gods, let me show you closer how handsome they are. You see these twisted six packs? That's always after Michelangelo. Uh, that was his style of studying ancient statues and then uh, the position, different positions of the body in their muscular frames. Now here to the right is uh, handsome Apollo, the patron of music and art. Uh, he's very important uh, for this collection. But now after 
uh, getting acquainted with the, with the gods. We'll get to the collection now. Uh, here we see a few busts and a few uh, paintings. Now let's start with the paintings. Uh, they were done by Bernini. Now, John Lorenzo Bernini, he marked the whole 1600s. Um, he dies 1683, he's 84 years old. And he's like the Michelangelo of the, of the 17th century. And uh, as a child, he witnessed uh, uh, the discussions between the, the artists, because his father was a sculptor, and this workshop, there were also painters, and they were always discussing like which art is superior, painting or sculpting. And uh, Galileo Galilei, uh, said that uh, it's always paintings because the sculptures are actually imitated, trying to uh, reach uh, the, the expression of a painting. So Bernini uh, got on studying painting. And uh, uh, the first portrait to the right is his self-portrait. He's 20 years old and then in the middle, he's more mature, he's in his 40s. And then to the left is just a portrait of a boy that was attributed to Bernini, but it's not 100% uh, certain. Now, this is the first thing he did for the for the Pope before the Cardinal. Uh, he was maybe 17, 18 years old, and the Pope loved this um, bust so much that he carried it with him in his journeys and used it as a paperweight. Now, there's another uh, portrait of the Pope. I'm just jumping from statues to the portraits to show you the similarities and how many uh, amazing works of art uh, we have in this gallery. This is a micro mosaic uh, from early 1600s and you see how Provenzano was the name of the artist, how he managed to represent the, the third border on the on the hat and uh, uh, the rope. But now back to our statues. Uh, you may have noticed there were two statues. This is one of them that looked identical. Well, they almost are, or they are, shall we say. Uh, this is the Cardinal, uh, Cardinal Scipione Borghese, and he was already retired. He would retire practically when your uncle died, so your, your career was as long as your uncle's life. But this is one year before he died in 1633. He died the richest man in uh, in Rome, which wasn't a small statement. And uh, Bernini made this uh, bust for the Cardinal. But as he was working, God no, there was uh, a crack on the forehead. And th this bust is absolutely amazing. You see how he um, caught the, the character of the of the Cardinal who was uh, uh, quite bossy, but at the same time amiable, but uh, he was avid, but he was avid collector of art. Again, with unorthodox methods, he even imprisoned artists a couple of times so that he could uh, lay his hands on their on their art. So he would not have appreciated this, uh, this crack. You see the way his mouth is open. Bernini would always say that you have to represent a person a fraction of a second before that person speaks and after it stopped speaking because that's uh, how you catch the actual character of that person. Now, what was Bernini to do with the crack? Well, quickly, uh, some say three days, some say two weeks, uh, but he made an identical one, which still had the little flaw. You see here at the chest, uh, uh, even the buttons are so amazingly realistic, but importantly, it wasn't on the forehead. So the Cardinal was impressed and uh, he liked them both actually. Now, Bernini showed his talent very, very um, young. Uh, some say that he made this little statue when he was 12, more likely 17. Uh, doesn't really, really matter, but uh, this is little Zeus, Jupiter, whom uh, his mother, uh, the goddess Rhea, uh, hid from his uh, uh, father, Saturn, who was, well, eating his kids. And uh, uh, she was, he was raised by the goat, uh, Amaltea, Amalthea, and uh, among the satyrs. Uh, satyrs are so lustful, and this is probably where little Zeus or Jupiter uh, became so lustful later in life. Without his love affairs, uh, uh, Greek mythology would be much more boring, but like this, it's quite exciting. So, uh, see how Bernini managed to represent the, the goat fleece versus baby skin. Uh, he was learning from that a theory of Galileo uh, trying to imitate painting, uh, the, the facial expressions and then the, the goat is probably in a little bit of a pain because you see her horns are missing. Her horn became the cornucopia 
uh, again the symbol of the return of the golden age and uh, uh, Zeus was so grateful to Amalthea that he turned her into a constellation of Capricorn. Now on the same floor there's another uh, extraordinary artist uh, Algardi. Uh, this is a little child sleeping. It could be a puto, uh, a putti, or these little chubby eventually become uh, angels in Renaissance and Baroque. In Baroque, they they really mean uh, they represent the, the, the presence of God. And uh, uh, the little child or puto or angel uh, sleeping. You see how um, the sleeping is similar to death. I know it sounds sinister, but uh, uh, that's why we have a little uh, badger here or marmot of a sort, uh, the symbol of sleep, but also uh, the pomegranate, the symbol of death, because it's the only fruit that's ripe in the winter months. Uh, no, Persephone could not turn entirely on Earth from the underworld because she ate a little bit of a pomegranate down there. Well, again, Algardi would have been much more famous had he not lived uh, in the time of much more famous Bernini. So now the Gallery Borghese has an amazing amount of art and uh, we could spend days and days and days, but uh, uh, we have altogether about an hour, so we have to start and finish with the most important. So uh, let me go to Raphael. This is a deposition uh, of Christ uh, famous painting. This is a bit of a strange position that you see because when I was there taking these pictures, these pictures a few months ago, it was under the restoration. And uh, uh, the way he depicted the body of Christ uh, may uh, recall the, the Pietà by Michelangelo, uh, then other works of art where it actually comes from the, the Greek sarcophagi. Uh, it was a hero, Miliager, who was represented in, in such a way carried to uh, to his tomb. And this painting has an amazing uh, history. It was painted for a family in Perugia, um, Baglioni, the mother, Atalanta, whose son was uh, killed in the family feud. Well, after he himself killed a few members of the family, so poor mother uh, was under shock regardless, and uh, uh, she commissioned this beautiful painting uh, for the family chapel in the church San Francesco in uh, in Perugia and this is probably where the Cardinal got acquainted with it and uh, uh, he loved it so much that when he became a Cardinal and the Pope's nephew uh, then the Pope uh, uh, would do anything for his nephew. For example, I'll tell you a little gossip again, um, that in Perugia the Cardinal met uh, a young man, uh, uh, Stefano Pignatelli, and uh, they were so much in love that when they were separated, the Cardinal suffered so much that his uncle brought Stefano to Rome, made him a Cardinal as well, and ever since the two Cardinals lived happily ever after. So Perugia uh, was uh, important for uh, Scipione Borghese, and, and this um, that position from the cross, we see the, the members of the Baglioni family. You see Mary uh, fainting. Uh, that is Atalanta Baglione and uh, uh, the lady helping her. Uh, she is important because this is a very obvious homage to Michelangelo, to his figure of uh, Our Lady at Tondo Doni in Uffizi Gallery or the Libyan Sibyl in the, in the Sistine Chapel, this twisted twisted body that's very Michelangelo-esque and uh, uh, the mother is again fainting and her handsome son, this young man carrying the body of Christ is actually uh, Grifonetto uh, Baglioni. Now more of Raphael, there is this lovely lady with the unicorn. We don't really know who she is, there are some theories, but uh, uh, we have our Mona Lisa in Rome and she's holding on to uh, quite a strange little animal. It's a unicorn, uh, it's a symbol of, of chastity. And uh, for many years, and even when the gallery was open to public in the 1900s, mm, it wasn't a unicorn. There was a wheel that was painted over, over. And why wheel? Because that's how we changed the identity of this lady. Unicorn is a bit uh, ambiguous as a symbol. So. 
uh, a wheel and, and the palm frond, well, that's St. Catherine of Alexandria. So uh, it was there until uh, director of the gallery, uh, brilliant, brilliant man, uh, realized that the brush strokes of the wheel were kind of different than the rest of the painting. So they removed, they flaked it off and the little original uniform, a unicorn uh, comes out. Now, this is now Fra Bartolomeo. Uh, he may not be as famous as the rest of them. He was a very, very uh, close friend of Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, as a curiosity, uh, I'll tell you that during the restoration, the conservation process, they found Leonardo da Vinci's uh, fingerprint uh, in, the, in the oil on, on the canvas. So I just imagine Leonardo passing by and saying, no, Fra Bartolomeo, like that. And he leaves his uh, fingerprint. Now, talking about uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, we have here the Last Supper, not his, obviously, because it's in Milan on the wall, but we have uh, uh, Bassano. This is approximately 30, 40 years after Leonardo painted his Last Supper, and uh, this is like everyday life. It's mm, the time when uh, the everyday scenes uh, find their way into art. So you see the dog, the cat, and uh, uh, it all looks like a very jovial conversation. Uh, uh, the Christ is in axial uh, position and the rest of the apostles are uh, conversating. Uh, um, it's like animated conversation. Uh, the tablecloth is wrinkled. These are like the remains of the of the supper and uh, uh, the head of a lamb on uh, on a plate uh, is like foretelling the sacrifice of Jesus as divine lamb. lamb. And a lovely portrait uh, by Lorenzo Lotto. We are still more or less in the same period, 15, early 1500s. Uh, there are some ideas about who this gentleman is, uh, uh, but uh, he's so sad and the, uh, the portrait also explains why he's sad. He's a widower. Now, uh, not just his eyes are so sad, but there's more to that. Left hand, uh, look at his little pinky. He's got two rings and uh, the small one, uh, he would have his own and then another like a little pink a uh, stone, uh, that's his wife's, because if the wife died, then he would add her uh, ring to his pinky because her fingers were much smaller. And uh, while he's wearing his wife's ring, he's also contemplating death. It's called memento mori, remember that we are mortal. Now, on a brighter note, we jump to uh, Titian's uh, uh, Venus blindfolding Cupid. Now, Venus was quite a lovely lady, so she had many children with many handsome gentlemen, gods or not, but the, the Cupids are her children with the, uh, Mars, and uh, she's a lovely lady. There are a couple of them here. One has his eyes open, but the other one is blindfolded. That will be the problem because these female helpers are preparing uh, the arrows, the bow and the, and the arrows, you know, to dispense the arrows and people fall in love. But frequently, it's, uh, well, not really a smart uh, decision because you're hit by an arrow that was uh, sent by a blindfolded little uh, troublemaker, Eros or Cupid. Now, this is a late Titian with uh, kind of mellow colors, uh, typical for his uh, later years. But when he was uh, younger, this is like 15, uh, 14, this is say the most famous um, painting of the of the gallery because uh, in the late 1800s the Rothschilds uh, offered four million lira for this painting and uh, it could not have been sold because the whole collection was tied with the FDI commission so that still exists because the owners of these collections are bound by the law that they cannot disintegrate and sell pieces. Either they sell the whole collection or nothing. So eventually the school collection was sold to the Italian state in 1904 for less, for 3.6 million, which was less than what Rothschilds, uh, Rothschilds offered for just this one painting. And the rivers of ink were spent on this painting. Uh, it's now called the sacred and profane love. 
and uh, uh, the original name was the beauty adorned and unadorned. So this is a more recent name since 1700s. So what is this all about? This was a wedding gift. And we see two ladies who are very, very similar, but um, they look as if they were like twin sisters. But the one uh, on the left is um, uh, very, sorry to go back to my Zoom. So she's uh, very serious and uh, uh, she even wears gloves and she's holding on to a vase uh, with jewelry. So these are uh, the symbols of uh, uh, temporary uh, happiness on, on Earth. And uh, uh, the little rabbits behind her, they are the animals uh, dear to Venus. They're like her little uh, pets, but they're also a symbol of uh, fertility. All these are temporary uh, joys. While uh, the naked lady, uh, this could also be a dispute between the Christian and the pagan ideals of, uh, of beauty, but here the sacred one is the naked one. Uh, because you know, Venus, truth, uh, the gods of the antiquity, and they were all represented naked. Nudity is um, heroic, uh, divine. And uh, uh, this lady is holding the eternal flame of the love of God. And uh, uh, all of that is uh, knowingly uh, mixed by this little cupid in this sarcophagus, where the water could be a sort of in a Christian key, like a baptismal font. You see the, uh, the learned guests of the Cardinal would always discuss everything in these uh, Neoplatonic smart concepts. And this little cupid is mixing up all these ingredients that we mentioned as characteristics of these two ladies, and that's how we make a perfect marriage. Now, the sarcophagus is really interesting. There are also there are symbols of love everywhere. They are not that obvious, but for example, the flower, the um, anemone uh, flower that you see at the bottom, uh, it actually sprung out of the tears of Aphrodite while she was mourning the death of her lover, Adonis. He was a hunter. She loved him uh, immensely. And her partner, Mars, was very, very jealous. So what you see here on the right hand side at the uh, sarcophagus, you see the flagellation, the flogging uh, in the Christian key. This would be like flagellation of Christ because also the, the red anemones, they symbolize in Christianity, the blood of Christ shed on the crucifixion. So now this was just a little um, like half a minute. I hope not more about this painting. Uh, the books and books were written about it. Now, Titian, a uh, Venetian painter, he came after Bellini. This is an amazingly beautiful Bellini. He, he was extremely prolific and uh, he was like the patriarch of these Venetian painters. After Bellini come Titian, Tintoretto, uh, Veronese, Giorgione. So Bellini uh, is the name to, to look for. You go in Venice and uh, also some other museums. You find his extraordinary works. And now, a uh, Sicilian painter, Antonello da Messina. Messina is a town in Sicily, but he spent some time in Venice and he was uh, uh, influenced by uh, Northern European painters. But uh, I like to mention him because uh, this extraordinary portrait is from the late 1400s. He didn't even live into the 1500s. And it is so realistic, you know, with this mild gaze, with this restrained smile. Uh, he's been looking at us like that for like, well, more than 500 years. And while you're walking through the gallery, you can't ignore the ceilings. Uh, these are obviously late uh, 1700s. Uh, uh, there's a lot of mythological scenes. This is about uh, Psyche, uh, the love of uh, Amore, Amor, Amor and Psyche, due to the intercession of uh, uh, Jupiter. She manages to join her love in Olympus. Uh, her main obstacle was jealous Venus, uh, so she had divine helpers. These ceilings demonstrate this extraordinary knowledge of foreshortening uh, the illusion illusionistic uh, um, architecture on the on the ceilings. Now more Venus, uh, uh, Venus everywhere. Uh, to the left, there's a copy of Titian. In the center is Cranach. Uh, and to the right, lovely Brescia, Nino, and Venere. She looks like she's coming out of the, of the niche. She's looking at the seashell. 
uh, that she was born out of. And uh, uh, her beauty is typically Italian, more like Sophia Loren. Here's more like Nicole Kidman. Uh, this is a German painter, Lukas Kranach. Lovely little Cupid uh, is uh, complaining to his mom because he loves honey, but he was stung by a bee and mom seems like she's saying, oh, well, you have to be careful next time. Now there's so much to see still. This is Correggio, uh, the story, again, the love of Zeus, one of the many. Danae, uh, she seems quite willing uh, to accept his uh, advances. He's transformed himself into a cloud with golden rain. But will the love be true? Well, these two little guys are checking on that. Uh, the endurance of love is tested as they are uh, scratching the tips of their arrows on a touchstone. This is a basalt stone to see if it's really gold. This is uh, the rock that was used uh, uh, since Indo Valley times, ancient Greece, to verify the, uh, the gold of the coins. Now, more ceilings I just have to show you as much as I can in such a brief time. This is uh, the story of Hercules, uh, who's also joining the gods in Olympus uh, after his uh, 12 labors. You can always recognize him by his uh, uh, club. And uh, uh, the six pack is so reminiscent of Michelangelo's uh, torsos and Adam and God. But this is very Baroque, where you see the spiral and not just an S, the spiral movement. Uh, this is uh, towards the end of his life, a long story about Hercules, his throwing Lycus, who brought him the poisoned shirt, unwillingly, poor thing. Now, there's also Rubens in the Gallery Borghese. Uh, this is not his best painting, but uh, uh, he's the father of Baroque paintings. Somebody had to. Uh, he came to Rome in uh, 1600. He was deeply influenced by Caravaggio and his realism. Uh, this is his uh, lovely Suzanne and the old man, uh, poor thing. Uh, this was like an opportunity to portray the female nudity. Uh, she emerges from the dark in this twisted position in biblical story, uh, Suzanne and the elders. And then uh, Domenichino, uh, again, 1600s were not all about Baroque. There was a lot of classical uh, in that. And Domenichino is one of the classical streak painters, uh, not realism, Caravaggio is realism. And uh, uh, this is back to mythology, back to classical uh, stories. This is Diane with her nymphs, with her little girlfriends. They're hunting and uh, showing off uh, their beauty as well. You see, they're sending off the, the dogs and uh, on, inside the painting, to show you here, there's a, there's a deer who they just uh, well, killed. And the deer is actually, uh, the, those are two deers or two boys who were watching them while they were bathing. And uh, as a punishment, they were transformed in deers. And uh, uh, that was a kind of a sad story. But uh, uh, to make it less sad, we have this lovely little lady who's inviting us to see how we are participating uh, in the in the painting. That's uh, very typical for the for the period. Who could resist this lovely lady? The cardinal certainly couldn't because this painting was painted by uh, Domenichino for another cardinal, Aldo Brandini, and our cardinal uh, loved it so much that he wanted to buy it and Domenichino refused. He said, well, I'm doing it on commission, but eventually the Cardinal put him in prison. Eventually he had to bail himself out. So he gave the painting to our Cardinal Borghese. Now, these little boys here are those who ended up as deers and they're inviting us to not tell anyone about this part of the story, but we just did. Now, in the same room, I uh, just wanted to show you Lavinia Fontana with the portrait of a young man. It's a female painter, one of the rare ones that made it at that time. But this mischievous little boy, that's Annibale Caracci, that's the beginning of the realistic uh, portraits, uh, which caused a big, big uh, scandal back then. Like, oh my God, it doesn't look lovely, but uh, it changes the history of art. And again, in the same room behind this imitation of the ancient Roman polychrome statue, uh, there is a painting 
which is typically typically Baroque. You see the whirlwind, the drama, the colors, Barocci, although he was a sort of in his own uh, uh, movie, in his own style, but the story goes back to the Trojan War. This is Aeneas, uh, the hero of Troy, the son of Venus. Uh, that's his old father, Anchise. He's carrying the um, uh, Penates, uh, the household gods. And there is his little son, uh, who will eventually become uh, the ancestor of Julius Caesar. You see how that goes. If you don't have anyone in the ancient Roman history, mm, they don't really qualify. So before we continue with Aeneas and uh, uh, the story of the Trojan War, I just would like to show you one more uh, work of art from the upper floor. This is a mosaic with Orpheus. And uh, he's enchanting the animals uh, with his uh, beautiful sweetness of his song. We see on the left uh, the dragon and the eagle, charming animals, totally in awe uh, in front of Orpheus. Uh, um, basically, this is uh, uh, drawing parallels between uh, uh, the cardinal as a conciliator and the mythological figure of uh, Orpheus, uh, uh, it is all stressed with the, the dragon and the eagle again, the, the coat of arms of the, of the family. But now uh, let's go back down to see the statues. Uh, this is uh, uh, the first statue, the first group, of st group it's called, that Bernini did for uh, the Cardinal Borghese. Borghese uh, Scipione had that painting that we just saw. Uh, with Aeneas and his father, and uh, uh, the Cardinal wanted it in, well, marble, no more, no less. So here's Bernini uh, with Aeneas, his old father, his little son, so the same as um, at the painting. But this may have been, look at it from behind, a sort of an excuse or opportunity to uh, carve the three ages of man, the um, fluffy little boy, and then the man in his prime, and the old father on his shoulders. Don't forget, Aeneas is the forefather of, of the Romans. In the same room, we jump in uh, history, but it's in the same room. Uh, some uh, 30 years later, Bernini fell out of grace. It happened to him as well. He made a mistake uh, uh, calculating the, the weight of the bell towers for the St. Peter's Basilica. And uh, uh, the, the Pope, another one now, Barberini, Urban VIII, uh, told him to repair the damage and uh, uh, pay for it and just get lost. Well, Bernini uh, was working for himself. He did not have a commission for the statue. It's called the truth, the naked truth. He just did it for himself because he wasn't entirely guilty. Uh, the calculations were done by somebody somebody else. And uh, uh, he just wanted to demonstrate that the truth will come out eventually, and it will be naked because that's what the truth is. Uh, there was a big piece of marble where Bernini would have carved the time, the father time, but uh, uh, eventually just it never was completed and uh, uh, he got back to work. But uh, his heirs uh, uh, sold the statue to the gallery. And uh, more of Bernini in this uh, extraordinary hall, the most decorated of all, it's the hall of the Caesars, the canonical 12 Caesars, but these are from the 17th century. The noble families uh, would uh, place these statues in their, in their halls because they were like ennobling the family through these fictitious ancestors. In Northern Europe, it was more typical to have the portraits of the members of the family. And in Rome, well, now let's go back to the emperors. That's the safest uh, route. And in that room now, there is a statue again by Bernini that was commissioned by our cardinal, uh, Cardinal Borghese, for another cardinal. Where, why would he do that? Uh, because it's 1621. His uncle died. There's another Pope Gregory the Fifteenth Ludovisi, and he has to ingratiate himself with the new power, and uh, uh, he commissions Bernini for the statue of Hades. Uh, uh, it's the, called the Rape of Proserpine, the daughter of uh, Demeter and Zeus. She will be the one who spends six months in the underworld and uh, six months on the surface. Uh, Bernini shows his extraordinary skills here. 
And there's little Cerberus, who will later become uh, Persephone's uh, little pet. But uh, everybody's always concentrated on how he grabs her thigh. It's just where Bernini makes the marble flow in the air and uh, it becomes soft. That's uh, what marble by nature is not, but he makes it become soft. And maybe uh, the message was grab the power while you can because it will last only as long as your uncle lasts. Now, again, back to the most popular part of the statue, but I always like to show not just that, but also how the Cerberus is barking. Now, for the first time in the history of art, we have the sound in the statue, if you could hear that dog barking. More Bernini, David, now we expect Michelangelo's David. No, he had to do something something else. Uh, this beautiful statue of, of David is surrounded by ancient Roman uh, sarcophagi, by paintings uh, from the 1600s, and gorgeous, gorgeous ceiling. Another illusionistic ceiling with perspective tools uh, such as foreshortening. But uh, uh, the story is interesting. It's about a young man who was the son of Apollo, the god of sun, and he begged his father to ride his carriage, but he wasn't skilled enough and he wreaked havoc. Uh, the rivers dried and everything burned, so Zeus had to send his thunderbolt and it's called the fall of Phaeton. He was struck by that thunderbolt and fell from the sky, together with his horses and the carriage. But now back to another drama below. This is David ready to hit Goliath. And we are the part of it. We are the viewer, but we have a role in this. We might be the Goliath, we might be in between. And uh, uh, this is the self-portrait of Bernini. Uh, David is not angry, he's uh, uh, intense, uh, he's concentrating, but he's not really angry. And they say that uh, uh, the future Pope uh, Maffeo Barberini, he'll be the Pope, was holding the mirror. And also from below, extraordinary views, and down uh, at his feet, his armor, because he's armed with faith, so he doesn't really need the armor, but his um, harp has the head of the eagle, because that's the symbol of Borghese, obviously. He's very young when he does all these statues in his 20s. And later architecture and all that, he goes back to sculpting, but uh, he was very young at this time. And uh, uh, something ancient Roman, this cute, is it a girl? Yeah, we would say so, but really not. This is hermaphrodite. And uh, this is the second copy uh, here in the gallery. The first one ended up in Louvre with all those uh, statues that were sold by Camillo Borghese. And uh, it's a boy and a girl, hermaphrodite and uh, uh, the nymph Salmasis. They, they merged in love. There are, there's a long story, but a uh, very popular figure. And I know everybody's curious about, well, what's in the telltale part? Well, in this museum, you cannot, you cannot see it, but you can Google hermaphrodite reverse, or you can come to Rome when all this is over and we'll go to Palazzo Massimo, the archaeological museum. There is another Roman replica of a Greek original. Now, the most extraordinary of the, of the statues, Apollo and Daphne. Uh, Apollo, the god, fell in, love, fell in love with the nymph who made a vow of virginity and uh, she asked her father, the river god, uh, if ever he lays his hands on me, turn me into a laurel tree, please, daddy. Well, that's exactly what's happening in front of our eyes. Uh, uh, her hands are becoming leaves and branches and uh, our, it's all drama that's also painted on the ceiling where you see uh, Ovid metamorphosis. Uh, the ceiling looks a bit more like a, a lovely picnic. This is neoclassical, not so much of the Baroque drama. But who caused all this? There he is, little Cupid. You see his arrows, one is gold and one is lead. And if he hits you with the lead one, you're gonna feel repulsion and not love. And poor Daphne, she's still screaming. This is Baroque expressiveness at its best, but the die is cast and she's turning into a tree. See the roots coming out of her toes. 
And at the bottom of the statue, there's this inscription that uh, sort of justifies the presence of so much nudity in the uh, Cardinal's collection. It basically says that whoever is fond of pursuing joys of fugitive forms and reaches out to the leafy branches to pick fruit will instead reap sorrow. So do not chase the fugitive uh, values because you will reap sorrow. So that's a Christian moralization uh, of this mythological theme that makes this nymph a symbol of virtue. I'm going to go very quickly through this Egyptian part of the museum. I just have to show it. There is a room entirely dedicated to Egyptian statues, the abundance of Nile in the center of the ceiling. And then, of course, a mixture with the Greek mythology, always the gods and the planets. Uh, here is Anubis, uh, uh, the, the god uh, Egypt, uh, one of the Egyptian gods heavily restored the satire. And now the main star, as if Bernini were not enough, uh, Caravaggio. Uh, Caravaggio was a violent, short-tempered uh, person. He eventually even killed a man. He had to escape from Rome. Uh, he would have been decapitated, uh, uh, charged with murder. And the Cardinal adored his paintings. And uh, so many painters followed uh, Caravaggio later. He was known for his uh, chiaroscuro, uh, very strikingly dramatic, uh, dirty feet, uh, uh, personalities. Uh, this is probably his self-portrait, but normally he would model his uh, uh, personalities on street people, even prostitutes. And uh, uh, this is a little sick Bacchus. Again, this is probably his uh, uh, self-portrait when he was very young, one of the first paintings that was in the collection of another painter that the cardinal imprisoned again to obtain the, the collection. Uh, here is another beautiful boy with the, the fruit basket where uh, the fruit started rotting already and uh, uh, this leaf is going to, to fall off. So that's something that Caravaggio introduced in, in art. Nothing was ever the same after that. And here is uh, uh, his Madonna uh, and Saint Anna, where you see how detached Saint Anna um, uh, look like, looks like, and uh, uh, it's very, very unorthodox, so not canonical. And the Blessed Mother was modeled on one of his uh, lady friends, ladies of the night. Uh, the way she's dressed and the way she looks, uh, it was all considered utterly inappropriate and uh, uh, eventually the guild that commissioned the painting uh, sold it to the, to the cardinal. And uh, the baby Jesus uh, looks, well, not very handsome, and also not a baby. And there is also a theological dispute here whether the sin was defeated by Mary with or without the help of Jesus. So there's a lot of a lot of things to say about Caravaggio. I'm actually preparing a presentation on Caravaggio. He's always a blockbuster, so such an interesting life, but not not very, very happy. And here is uh, uh, there are two paintings of which one at the top is not Caravaggio, but it shows you how this master of the Solomon's judgment uh, was influenced by, by Caravaggio with this drama and uh, uh, the chiaroscuro, very, very unconventional. But the whole century becomes Caravaggesque after that. Even Velasquez, Rembrandt, uh, Rubens, uh, they all followed followed Caravaggio. And uh, at the bottom is his uh, Saint Jerome. Uh, uh, he's, um, you see, old and his skin is kind of sagging and everything is so realistic. Uh, it was it was a big scandal back then, but the smart people always protected him, the cardinals and the nobility, but he was extremely uh, difficult to handle and very violent. And eventually he was pardoned by the Pope, but he dies on the way on the way back to Rome and uh, uh, some of the paintings he carried with him from, uh, he was in Malta, Sicily, Naples, uh, the ship that he came with uh, to Tuscany, he dies there and uh, uh, never reaches Rome. And this painting bears the traces of salt. So it must have been with him on that uh, ship. 
and uh, the painting that he painted for the cardinal, but did not have a chance to give it to him directly because he well died, uh, was David with the head of Goliath, where the head is his self-portrait. Now, David also is quite not canonical. That's probably a portrait of one of his little friends, little Caravaggino. And together, they're kind of a strange couple. But uh, uh, just imagine that after Caravaggio painted this blood from the severed head, nothing could have been ever the same in the history of painting again. But to conclude on a brighter Writer note, uh, let's go to the room with Paulina Borghese, uh, gorgeous ceiling again. There's uh, the Judgment of Paris. We go back to the Trojan War all the time. And uh, Paris uh, uh, had a chance uh, to recognize the beauty of Venus as superior to that of uh, uh, Minerva and, uh, and Hera. And uh, uh, Paulina married Camillo Borghese, Marriage was happy at the beginning, they say, and she even commissioned this statue for her husband. Uh, it was um, carved by Canova, the most outstanding artist of the neoclassical period. He was even the minister of the Pope and managed to bring some works of art from Paris. But the uh, uh, Borghese collection was sold and it, it remained uh, in, uh, in Paris. And the marriage soured uh, quite, quite soon and uh, Paulina and uh, Camilo Borghese is separated, but the statue remains uh, uh, surrounded by these ancient Roman masterpieces. And uh, Canova was a genius and uh, another one. And in the bed, there was, there still is, it was restored from what I've heard, but I've never seen it rotating. There is a mechanism that would make the statue rotate so you could stand in one corner and then look at the statue in front of you as it whirls around. It's a beautiful, beautiful setting, but let's not forget this was all caused by the apple of discord uh, that br brings us to the Trojan War and the beautiful Helen. But uh, I'll bring you even farther than that, because before the apple of discord, there was the beautiful Helen, obviously. And uh, uh, she was the daughter of Zeus. She wasn't just some cute blondie. She was the daughter of Zeus and the queen of Sparta, Leda. And uh, uh, here is the story where Zeus was making advances to uh, the Queen of Sparta, who was very proper, she refused. But then he transforms himself into a swan. And whatever difference that made, she comes up with eggs. And we have the Dioscores, Castor and Pollux, the Gemini constellation, Clytemnestra, and the beautiful Helen come out of those eggs. Well, here uh, Leda seems quite, quite willing. Actually, her body has a different body, body language with respect to her head, because the head uh, was grafted on the statue in the 19th century. The, the statue was uh, headless, and this is the head of Antonia Minor, a daughter of Mark Anthony. So that's why this discrepancy uh, between the, the head and the body, but uh, it seemed like a good pendant to uh, Paulina Borghese. And as a part of that little group, there's this funny face. Uh, well, when you see an exaggerated face like that, and there are plenty of them all around the museums, uh, these are the theatrical masks, because from the Greek times into Roman theater, uh, tragedies, comedies, satirical plays, uh, uh, the actors were wearing masks to be seen from far away. And uh, underneath the mask, you can see that little mouth of an actor who's actually been whispering into my ear for about an hour now. And uh, I hope you believed everything I said because that's what he was telling me. And uh, I always remember going to the Gallery Borghese and uh, um, wrapping up my day as I'm going to wrap up this presentation now in a nearby restaurant, which I will be happy to, to recommend uh, if anybody asks, uh, with the pasta le vongole, con la botarga. Well, uh, when in Rome. So, oh, <laughs> I hope I um, managed to, to cover everything. Uh, I had to hurry up a little bit, but that was out of desire to really share all the amazing art that the Gallery Borghese offers. Olga, thank you so much. 
That was really enlightening and a joy to come with you on this whirlwind tour of Galleria Borghese. Um, we are almost um, up with our time. Actually, we are a little bit over our time. So um, let me take the opportunity to thank um, all of the many people who have come to join us this evening. I hope you, you've enjoyed the program. Um, for those of you who would like to um, stay for a bit of a Q&A, we have some questions that people have posted while you were talking, Olga. Um, for those, if you are happy to answer them, Olga, we yes. can go through. Yeah. OK, so um, is there a, a fee to visit the gallery? Somebody wants to know? Yes, yes, there, there is a fee and uh, the reservations are compulsory. Now, these are very strange times. Now I'll tell you what's the normal procedure. Uh, we always make reservations uh, uh, way ahead because it's sold out. They only let uh, about 200 people every two hours normally. Uh, so it, I highly recommend making reservations before that. Be careful, ask somebody because frequently other sites pop up that are not the original sites of the gallery and they sell you actually a guided tour, which you may not want. So if you want a local guide, contact contact your guide uh, directly who will make a reservation. There is a little fee, but it's basically compulsory because if you show up, maybe somebody gave up, but no, there are little chances you will you will enter. So think about visiting the gallery a little bit ahead. OK, so that's useful to know. Um, the paintings and statues are in a beautiful condition. How has this been achieved? Um, somebody wants to know. I can't see who. Well, the uh, the restoration is constant. I remember when I came to Rome uh, uh, for the first time in the 18, uh, 1800s, in the in 1980s, uh, that the, the gallery was entirely under the, the restoration. Also later in 97, uh, it was prepared heavily when it was open to public in the early 1900s when it was bought by the Italian state. So it's, it's a constant process and it happens uh, uh, periodically. Uh, now the Italian state invests uh, and uh, uh, even in the older, older times, these wealthy families were taking good care of their of their art. So it requires a lot of a lot of investment, definitely. Great. And um, somebody says just to say what a beautiful gallery and would love to visit one day. Also, thanks to Olga, she describes things beautifully. Lovely to listen and learn. Um, can you tell us about the gardens, please? Are there any artworks in it? Uh, yes, uh, there are mainly the, um, how to say, the gesso in, uh, in English, the plaster casts. And uh, uh, there are the statues of Goethe and uh, um, other poets. Uh, there are the fake ruins. Uh, uh, recently, there was an exhibition of contemporary uh, statues, but the gardens are basically uh, pedestrian huge gardens and there are other museums in the gardens. Uh, just the Gallery Borghese is the most popular, but it's not the exhibition space because they would end up damaged by the atmosphere or by crazy people who sometimes damage statues. But there are some, some. Okay. But it's space. Calculate 80 hectares or 200 acres, so uh, there is a lot of lot of walking. All right, better get your walking shoes on, um, and nothing like what you have in the background, which is uh, very high heel. <laughs> yes, Almodovar. I bought it in Provence <laughs> in a movie buff uh, shop. Joel wants to know: Were statues statues in the 16th century ever painted like the Roman Greek ones, or were they always kept raw to mimic the ancient statues, which uh, by that point would have faded in terms of color? That's a, that's that's a great question because uh, at that time. Uh, the artists uh, were trying to imitate classical always, and uh, they didn't know that the ancient statues were actually painted because by that time uh, the pigment faded. And uh, only with the more recent excavations where we started treating the, uh, the remains that spent centuries somewhere in the dirt, uh, more gently uh, using even ultrasound. They used to bleach them because they were so dirty. So when they would come out to light, Everybody thought they were actually originally white, like classical white. Winkleman, you know, he thought it was all white. No, it wasn't. But it's um, a recent discovery that ancient statues were not white. 
So these artists like Bernini, they, were, they, they thought they were imitating the classical white, which wasn't white. But there's um, all the Renaissance, you know, from Michelangelo on Bernini, they all made them white and never dared painting them because they would consider that a sacrilege. So who painted the ceilings you showed us? Uh, were they, would, would somebody, we know that Michelangelo did the Sistine Chapel uh, ceiling. It's a completely different type of painting when you, when you imagine it, even physically. Um, all of the paintings, uh, all of the ceilings you showed us, they were done by uh, renowned artists or? Uh, allora, here it shows I live in Italy, Allora. Uh, the first one I showed you was Lanfranco. Lanfranco was a big star uh, of the 1600s, the one with the, uh, the group of gods, like all gods of Olympus, Lanfranco. All the other ceilings, that was the, that's the only ceiling, painted ceiling that survives from the previous version of the villa. So all the other ceilings were painted in the late 1700s and uh, for each one there were different teams. Now off the tip of my tongue I'll tell you there was one uh, um, uh, Tyrolean uh, artist, Unterberger, uh, there was Angeletti, uh, there was, uh, uh, was it? no not Mengs but uh, the name Tom Tommaso Conca for the Egyptian so they're not as much known as, uh, for example, Michelangelo, or obviously, or Andrea Pozzo or so, because they come later in art when, for example, this perspective thing has become quite common, but they're at the peak of it. Their skills are absolutely amazing, but it's already uh, old news, extraordinary old news. But that's, that's why, yes, they were famous uh, more locally than, than internationally, because they, for the difference of Michelangelo, they didn't bring in anything new. They reproduced what they've already seen before to an extreme level, but it's still. So yes, I mentioned a few that, remember now I'd have to look at my notes, and then you would have like different workshops for the so-called quadro riportato, which is the transferred painting, that's how it's called and a different workshop for the uh, perspectives in the corners. So it wasn't always even the same person, maybe even two teams were working on the same ceiling because they require different skills. Highly specialized, it seems, mm -hmm. yes. So um, were any of the artifacts in the Borghese collection looted during World War II, I think? It would appear not because no, because Rome that. was the so-called open city during the the Second World War. Uh, Italy was allied with Germany, and then later on, yes, there was a lot of damage done, basically by Allied bombing. But uh, it wasn't bombed or looted. No, I mean the gallery itself. From from what I know, uh, from what I know, no, no, nothing, no, nothing like that. Um, so uh, somebody wants to know, was Bernini an artist in residence then, living in the palace when he sculpted Apollo and Daphne? Uh, the palace was never living quarters, never. Uh, it was a purpose-built uh, palace, palazzo, just to show off the, it was a country, uh, country villa, uh, they called it Casino, it has nothing to do with Casino. Uh, casino, uh, that was to show art, uh, to uh, have guests for um, conversations. There was one of the rooms where the Cardinal would have a nap, but he wouldn't live there. So not, not even uh, Bernini. Uh, he had a residence uh, for some time near the Spanish steps, which were not that far away. But uh, he may have had a little dwelling somewhere nearby to have a rest or maybe probably have a nap in the corner, but he didn't really live because nobody lived there. Okay. They had um, other palazzi, they, they still own the, the palazzi. All right, I'm now rushing to get through a few more of these questions because we will have to wrap it up soon. Probably you need a drink, as it's uh, probably no. Olga. Um, so what's the name of that painting by Lavinia Fontana you showed? That, that is uh, uh, a young boy by Annibale Caracci. Uh, Annibale, like Hannibal, Karachi. If anything, you see my, my site is here. You can, you can write to me and ask me if you have questions later. I'll be happy to answer. But Annibale Karachi uh, was the, um, the founder of the Bolognese school from which uh, Lanfranco, Domenichino, uh, they come out from that school. And uh, he did another really famous one that I mentioned, the Bean Eater, which is at Palazzo 
Palazzo Colonna, but his main specialty were these classical ceilings like at Palazzo Farnese and a lot of what you saw in the gallery uh, Borghese was actually the imitation in the, in the first instance of Annibale Caracci. Caravaggio was so fascinated by him that he wanted to compete with him all the, all the time. So yes, the young boy by uh, Annibale Caracci. All right, there's another, somebody has caught the attention at the very beginning or, or towards the beginning of your presentation. The man painted, is the man painted on the horse, um, painted to look three dimensional or is it actually a sculpture that's it's kind of sticking out of the wall? I think it's a sculpture that's sticking sculpture. out of the wall. Uh, the, the rider was done by Pietro Bernini, father of Gian Lorenzo. The horse is ancient Roman. So they composed, put together. They did what was very popular, of course, pat pastiche of, of a sort. Really. Pastiche was something that came slightly later, like a combining bits and pieces, but uh, they put together two pieces that have nothing to do with each other to start with, but together they make a story. But they're statues, yes. Okay, a lot, lots of people are sending their congratulations and thanks. Um, somebody says, may I ask, how does the gallery manage its collection? From your sharing, I can see it has a huge collection of sculptures. How does the gallery store and conserve all its collection? How do they store it? Uh, I honestly don't know that uh, because I don't know where would they have, because the collection doesn't really change in, in time. It has been like frozen in time, uh, more or less. Not, not many new pieces, but they probably do have storage space uh, because as you enter the gallery, you first go downstairs to get the tickets and there's the, you know, the bathrooms and the, and, the, and the cafe and the bookshop. There must be other spaces there uh, to, to store other pieces. Then the family, calculate that the family Borghese, although they have nothing to do with, the, uh, with this gallery now, they also have the collection of paintings at their palazzo, which is not open to, to public. So there's, there's a lot of art there, but that I wouldn't, wouldn't know the logistics of the storage. In, in that case, in their case, I don't know where they would keep things. OK, there are two um, uh, quite re related but quite interesting questions. Um, one is, why was it not considered heresy for cardinals to commission works featuring Roman gods, which would have been considered false gods by the Catholic Church? And um, the second question that goes hand in hand with that is, um, or a comment, I was surprised at the lack of Christian art when it was the pride and joy of popes and cardinals. I, of course, realized that many or most um, of those faults were, were not particularly religious, but I would have thought for the sake of the optics or appearances, there would be more Christian art on display rather than all the nudes and all the... Um, yes, that, that's, that's a, another, another good question. Uh, don't forget this is a private collection. And uh, uh, the Renaissance, which starts in Florence and spreads all over 14, 1500s, is the revival of the classical. And uh, the, the learned people start collecting cl classical art where they study uh, the, the philosophy behind those nudities, which is, again, every nudity is either heroic or athletic or divine. And uh, uh, the Counter-Reformation, after a long period of uh, um, corruption on the Catholic Church, and then there comes the, the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. Counter-Reformation forbids all these nudities. Remember how they uh, painted those speedos on Michelangelo's nudities on the, on the Last Judgment, because he was a Renaissance man. And uh, uh, when um, a tough cardinal was visiting from Spain, uh, the one who was known for very uh, uh, strong stance on morals and all that, that's when uh, Cardinal Borghese wrote down quickly on the, the naked Daphne statue, if you're pursuing these superficial things, you will reap sorrow. To justify the, the myth, uh, the classical has always been in the learned people collections and classical being ancient Roman and, uh, and Greek and Egyptian uh, as well, eventually. Uh, Etruscan. So uh, there is some Christian art and uh, uh, you saw like the opportunity for a naked body, basically the, the poor Suzanne with the elders, but there's also the deposition from the from the cross and definitely, yes, not, not very much 
uh, uh, Christian because it's a learned person uh, nest where he receives the philosophers, the Neoplatonics, the uh, everybody has to be impressed by his by his knowledge. And privately, they all had such uh, such collections in the Vatican as well. Uh, so the key is that it was a private collection of a very learned man who was interested in the world and in the latest ideas about the world uh, of his time and his collection um, was not actually ever meant to be seen by the likes of us probably. He never th yeah. dreamed of us going yeah, around and, and checking yes. his tastes. Um, okay, I will power through. I have three four questions. Churches. Four churches, not that he didn't, you know, he did his duty. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, yes. But this um, is... So, Olga, any advice for, your, for a young art historian? Come to Rome. There you go. <laughs> okay, um, I know, I know. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, for a young historian. Um, I'm sure if you, if you are a young art historian, I don't know if you graduated or not, but if you're at the beginning, then just buy a Gombrich, uh, the, the story of art. Go uh, to the library, get Gombrich. We have Gombrich in the library for all of you who are in Kensington. <laughs> duh, duh, yes, but uh, if you are uh, like a graduate, you probably are familiar with uh, with Gombrich as, as a starting point. Uh, uh, I would say there's so much material online and uh, uh, all these galleries now are opening uh, their uh, doors like a digital. You can download a lot of things uh, and uh, uh, once you got the basics, you can then you have the main tree and then you can have the, the branches and the leaves. Uh, there, there's so much for, for a lifetime. Um, go JSTOR is a great, if you're an academic, JSTOR is a great source of uh, essays on uh, on art. And uh, always, my, my advice for that is always read also two different versions because there's no uh, more dangerous thing than reading just one version of just about anything. So if I can put a plug for libraries there, we have um, if people join libraries wherever they are, their local libraries will most probably offer a host of online resources which they will be able to access. A lot of them will be encyclopedias of art. Our library offers um, Grove Art Encyclopedia um, and um, many other um, um, you can get magazines, art magazines. Um, you can really delve into um, into a subject of interest by using just what we have online. So I'm sure that's replicated across the board. Um, Olga, what is your favorite piece? Really quickly, this is from Sonia. What is my favorite favorite piece? Uh, I'd say I'd say Caravaggio, Caravaggio, uh, uh, the David oh. Goliath. I know it's very gory probably because I, I watched so many horror movies when I was a child, but uh, he's so, so striking. I don't like the personality of Bernini. He didn't seem to have been uh, a nice, well, Caravaggio wasn't a nice person either, but in a different way. And uh, I somehow my heart goes more to, to Caravaggio than to Bernini, although I just have to remain in awe every time I see what Bernini did. So, Caravaggio. Fantastic, Olga. And the last question before I thank you profusely for this um, session. Um, what is the name of the restaurant? <laughs> San Marco. San Marco, like the uh, like the cathedral in Venice, like the La Basilica di San Marco, St. Mark's. And uh, it's in uh, this business district uh, right across the wall. Uh, you just go through the water and uh, uh, it's a very big restaurant and a lot of fancy people come for lunch because it's a business district in a very elegant part of Rome and uh, they're really good. Um, it's, it's a big restaurant. Usually they uh, go down with reputation up and down, but with my colleagues, we usually with our clients, we end up at San Marco. That's safe. Those vongole look absolutely delicious. I could I could finish a plate of that in a second now. Um, Olga, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you to everybody who's joined us. Um, and come again. Olga is doing a session. Please, Olga, tell them about the February session you're doing for us. I'll say goodbye on behalf of the library. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Uh, it will be a session on the Torlonia marbles. I know it may sound like who are these guys, but this is uh, a very late nobility in Rome that managed to amass a collection that goes like more, more than a thousand pieces. And uh, uh, for the first time in so many decades, 
uh, there is the exhibition of these about 100 pieces from the Torlonia collection. It was stopped by, by COVID and pandemic, but uh, there's a lot of gossip about the, the family connected with all other papal families and the, uh, the power in Rome. The collection is absolutely extraordinary. So it's, um, it's an interesting story about practically Torlonia are the wealthiest family in Rome now, and they didn't even have a pope. So uh, when you say that, it requires some skills. They're bankers as well, but we'll get into that on uh, February 24th. I'd love to see you there. Thank you, Olga. Wonderful. I'll be there for sure. Good. Bye, everyone. Bye.